the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Welcome to This Week in Royal History. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson. This Week in Royal History was created to encourage fans of the show to continue spreading out from the Tudors. Now, I don't want you to leave the Tudors by any means, but sometimes when we look outside a time period, we're presented with people, places, and events that help shed light on why things happened or what the catalyst was for changes made. And after we return from this short break, we're going to look at the week of November 13th through the 19th. And as we start our journey through history this week, we begin at Windsor Castle in 14th century England. The castle at this time already had the layout we see today and was seen as the most significant medieval fortress in England. At this safe location behind the stone walls, Queen Consort Isabella of France gave birth to a son, Edward, in 1312 named after his father, King Edward II of England. At birth, he would be called Edward of Windsor, but you'll likely know him as King Edward III. In 1325, at about 12 years old, Edward was created Duke of Aquitaine and was sent to France with his mother. Once there, Edward and Isabella would negotiate a peace treaty with her brother, Charles IV of France. Even though they were attempting to negotiate a peace treaty, due to the unpopularity of Edward II's reign, Isabella conspired with her brother to have Edward II deposed. She even partnered with an English nobleman named Roger Mortimer, and together they defeated Edward II's forces. On the 1st of February, 1327, Edward was crowned King Edward III at Westminster Abbey. He was 14 years old. Roger Mortimer quickly took charge in England and was very unpopular. But three years later, at 17 years old, Edward III had Mortimer executed. It was that moment his personal reign began. Edward III married Philippa of Hainault on the 24th of January, 1328, a marriage that was agreed upon while his mother conspired against his father. Their first son, Edward of Woodstock, later known as the Black Prince, was born on the 15th of June, 1330. They would go on to have 13 children, though not all would live to adulthood. Edward and Philippa are ancestors to the fighting cousins of the Wars of the Roses through their sons Lionel of Antwerp, 1st Duke of Clarence, John of Gaunt, 1st Duke of Lancaster, and Edmund of Langley, 1st Duke of York. Edward's reign saw the beginning of the Hundred Years' War with France, which intensified in 1340 when Edward attempted to claim the title of King of France through his mother, since Charles IV died without any heirs. However, the French rejected this claim since the French followed the Salic law, and neither a woman nor her descendants could claim the French throne. 1360 marked the end of the first phase of the wars with the Treaty of Brittany. Edward renounced his claim to the French throne, but would take all of Aquitaine. While Edward's early reign saw great success and land acquisition in France, by the time of his death, most of what was won was lost back to the French, with the English only holding on to Calais, Bordeaux, and Bayonne. Edward III died on the 21st of June, 1377, at Sheen Castle in England, outliving his wife by eight years. He was succeeded by his 10-year-old grandson, Richard II, and we know how that story ended. Some might argue that the deposal of Richard II by Henry IV could be the cause of the Wars of the Roses. Here's an interesting Tudor connection. According to the National Portrait Gallery, Henry VIII named his son Edward after King Edward III. Much like Henry VII before him, Henry VIII had a fascination with the legend of King Arthur, 
Now, contemporary writers of Edward III often compared him to King Arthur because Edward wished to establish a round table of knights at Windsor. As we move forward from the world of Edward III in the 14th century, we pass through the reigns of Richard II, as well as Henry's the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth, and we arrive 100 years later in the reign of King Edward IV. One of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville's favorite country residences was Eltham Palace, and it was where their daughter Catherine was born in August 1479. Catherine was their sixth daughter and ninth child. She was considered a potential bride for John of Aragon, son of Ferdinand II of Aragon and Isabella I of Castile, as well as a potential bride for James Stuart, the son of James III of Scotland. In the end, Catherine was married to William Courtney, a marriage arranged by King Henry VII, her brother-in-law, in 1495. Catherine and William had three children, though not all lived to adulthood. Catherine and William were regularly at court, and she was a chief mourner at her sister, Elizabeth of York's funeral in 1503. Her husband was charged with treason in 1504 for his dealings with Edmund de la Pole, but was pardoned in 1509 and restored at court in 1511 by Henry VIII. William died in 1511, and Catherine took a vow of celibacy in July of that year. Catherine enjoyed a good relationship with her nephew, Henry VIII, and was godmother to his daughter, Mary. Catherine died this week in 1527 at 48 years old. She was the last of her siblings to die. Let's jump forward in time from a 15th century king to an 18th century queen. Frederica Caroline Wilhelmina was born on the 13th of July, 1776, to Charles Louis, hereditary prince of Baden, and Amelie of Hesse-Darmstadt. Of her three names, she chose to go by Caroline. To give us some perspective, in the American colonies in July 1776, the first public readings of the Declaration were held in Philadelphia's Independence Square to the ringing of bells and band music. That was only five days before Caroline was born. She was the eldest child of her parents, but she also had a twin sister. And interestingly enough, after she married her husband in March of 1797, they had two sets of identical twin daughters. Then in 1799, her husband became Maximilian IV Joseph, elector of Bavaria. And in 1806, he became Maximilian I Joseph, king of Bavaria, making Caroline queen consort of Bavaria. Caroline was allowed to remain a Protestant and even kept her own pastor at court. She died this week in the year 1841 at 65 years old. Caroline was buried with little royal dignity as she was Protestant and her clergymen were not allowed inside for the service. An interesting side note it was also Caroline's eldest twin daughter's 40th birthday on the day that she died. The Victorians truly had their own interpretation of history and how to share the stories of the past. But that doesn't make the reign of Queen Victoria any less fascinating, does it? Well, maybe a little more romanticized. Now, we've all heard the stories of how much Queen Victoria loved Albert and how their love is one for the ages. The attraction between the pair was so strong that Victoria was frequently pregnant in the first 17 years of their marriage. Victoria and Albert's children, as prince and princesses of the United Kingdom and its territories, had marriages that were well arranged. Their children, the grandchildren of Victoria and Albert, 
would go on to make good matches as well. In the spring of 1874, Marie Victoria Theodore Leopolding was born to Louis IV, Grand Duke of Hessen Rhine, and Alice of the United Kingdom. She would be known as Princess Marie of Hesse and by Rhine. Her mother Alice was the daughter of Queen Victoria and Albert, and Marie shared her birthday with her grandmother, Queen Victoria. Tragedy struck, however, in 1878 when disease entered the royal household. Diphtheria. Today, diphtheria is preventable by vaccine, but in the seventh decade of the 1800s, it could be deadly. The symptoms would include sore throat, fever, swollen lymph nodes, and weakness. But it also affects the patient's breathing with a thick gray matter that covers the back of the throat, making it difficult to breathe. And without proper antibiotics, once contracted, could be deadly. Alice and Louis's daughter Victoria was the first to ring the alarm, reporting that she had a stiff neck. Worried it could be the mumps, she told her mother Alice, who brushed it off. The next morning, Victoria was diagnosed with diphtheria. A week later, Alex was also diagnosed. It would be our Mary who was next to contract the illness, but she would not be as lucky as her other siblings. And in the following days, her siblings Irene and Ernest became ill, as well as their father Louis. It was on the 16th of November, 1878, that Marie succumbed to the disease. Her sister Victoria, who was the first to contract it, says that her mother Alice was asleep when her daughter died. When she was informed, she ran to the nursery and sat by her daughter's body, kissing her hands and face, while trying to work up the courage to tell her husband of their loss. Marie's mother, who nursed her children and husband back to health, also contracted the disease and died only four weeks after Marie. They were laid to rest together, and a statue of Alice holding Marie in her arms was placed at their tomb. In 2021, Queen Elizabeth II and the royal family as a whole lost its patriarch, Prince Philip. Philip lived to be nearly 100 years old, but his older sister, Cecily, would not be so fortunate. Born during the summer of 1911 to Prince Andrew of Greece and Denmark and Princess Alice of Battenberg, Cecily was the third of five children and was older than her brother, Philip, by a decade. Her story is one that we could probably discuss at length, but today we'll give you the brief version. Through her mother, Cecily was a great-great-granddaughter of Queen Victoria. In February 1931, at 20 years old, she married a cousin, Georg Donatus, hereditary Grand Duke of Hesse and by Rhine. Their first child, Prince Ludwig, was born that October, and Prince Alexander and Princess Johanna soon followed. Tragically, this week in 1937, Cecily Georg and their two sons were killed in a plane crash as they traveled to London. Cecily was eight months pregnant at the time, and it's assumed that she began to give birth on the aircraft, and that was what prompted an emergency landing. They were survived by their one-year-old daughter, Johanna, who was not on the plane. And that concludes this week in Royal History. I'm Rebecca Larson. I'll see you again next Sunday. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.